Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we have with us a renowned artist um, and someone who has uh, been commissioned to do some uh, really important work that I'll mention in a moment. But first of all, his name is Masood Olafani. He is an Atlanta-based actor, mixed media artist, and writer. He is a graduate of Morehouse College and the Savannah College of Art and Design, where he earned Masters in Fine Arts in Sculpture in 2013. Masood has exhibited his work in group and solo shows nationally and internationally. He is the, 21, the 2021 and 2022 inaugural Visual Arts Fellow at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. In addition, he has completed residencies at the Vermont Studio Center, the Hambridge Center for the Arts and Sciences, and Creative Currents in Portobello, uh, uh, Panama. Masood is the recipient of a 2015 and a 2018 Idea Capital Grant, a Southwest Airlines Art and Social Engagement Grant, and a recipient of 2015-2016 MOCA Georgia Working Artist Project Grant. He's, he has a global healing project, a multimedia performance created to memorialize spaces marked by trauma of the transatlantic slave trade. As an actor, he has had a recurring role on BET in which he played on the quad and has appeared in numerous television shows such as Greenleaf, Being Mary Jane, Devious Maids, Satisfaction, and Nashville. I could go on and on. He, is, well, he was a co-host for, co for a PBS uh, uh, series, but I would like to uh, share a little bit about Masood, the person, so that we can really connect in a relationship, on a relationship basis with this very accomplished man. In talking with Masood, I was, I was uh, impressed to hear him say the way in which he had to grow up. He was one of those individuals that grew up as an abused child, but because he was also blessed with the ability to do art, he was able to use art as a way to uh, protect himself internally, spiritually from what he was experiencing. He said that if it were not for art, he didn't know how he would, be, would have survived his growing up experience and what he would be now. There's no, there was no way for him to be able to tell. When we have individuals who grow up in different kinds of abusive situations, whether it's individually from their family or whether it's collectively from the society in which they live as black people experience. We talk about one person that has been extremely successful and we forget about the thousands who were not able to make it. Masood wanted us to make sure that we know that he was one of the blessed ones because he had this gift, because he was given some kind of resilience that may have been a little bit more than what the average, he was able to make it. So I want to introduce you to this man who survived against all odds and was able to go on to Parsons College where he actually was isolated and ended up having to feel very much alone. So he transferred to Morehouse College where he was able to be with others like him and could focus on who he is as an individual versus having to prove who he is as a black man. Please welcome with me, Masood Olafani. Hi, Sue, thank you. Wow, that's amazing. That was so amazing. Um, man, I'm gonna have to talk about you doing like publicity or something, that's incredible. <laughs> you made me sound pretty cool. Uh, so good to see you. Thank you for, uh, for being here and for, uh, it's such an honor to be in this space with you and all the incredible work that you're doing. And uh, just to, to be able to spend a little time with you is really a blessing. And thanks for that. What, is, what I was hoping that you would like to do 
mm -hmm. uh, is go on with your presentation. But before sure. you do, yeah, I wanted you to share a little bit mm -hmm. about the background of where yeah. you're at. I'm looking at these amazing faces. Yeah. And I understand you created them. Tell us something about that. Well, uh, part of the residency that I'm doing here at Emory University um, is uh, to have an exhibition um, here in the spring. So I'm working, I was turning over in my mind and my consciousness what I wanted to work on. And I'm doing a series of sculpture mixed media works called uh, Iterations of Resistance. And they look at the various ways, the various modalities of the African-American community and uh, specifically, but the African diaspora community at large uh, has implemented to survive under um, extreme duress uh, throughout the centuries. And so the one that you see in the background I'm working on is about self-defense. Um, I have these uh, several cut out cross sections of trees, native tree species from the state of Georgia. And I'm doing these Conti crayon drawings on the surface and also burning, I'm using burning marks as well. Um, and then there's a series of um, shotguns that will be um, pointing towards the viewer that will come off the surface of the trees themselves. Uh, it got me thinking about um, um, Oklahoma and Black Wall Street. It got me thinking about um, also how we view uh, in, in America, we celebrate revolution, we celebrate um, iterations of American resistance to oppression, whether it's at, you know, the Boston Tea Party or whatever you want to call it, uh, the, you know, the War of um, 1812, 1777. Um, but there still is this um, disconnect when it comes to Black men, Black people defending themselves um, against oppression, wielding a kind of agency, right? that um, where they're saying, you will not offend my family, people that I care about, I'm gonna take a stand this point and no further. And that still seemed that image of a black man carrying um, you know, a, a gun or something to defend himself or taking a posture of self-defense is something that is inherently problematic in the American psyche, makes us very uncomfortable. So I wanna confront the viewer in this work and, um, and uh, just uh, you know, as much as I can have them kind of have to wrestle with that idea, what that means for each individual as they interact with the work. So this is one of the iterations of resistance. There's also one based on faith. There's one based on improvisation, which is through basketball. Um, there's um, uh, one based on community. There's these various iterations of resistance that African-Americans have employed to survive. And um, so that's what I'm wrestling with in the studio and engaged in. And that's, that's the one you're looking at right now, the one about self-defense, which I'm working on, so. You're muted. There you go. That is very powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Because we look at these faces and yeah. you just want to know what is this? What is, but these are, this is a uh, tree bark. Mm -hmm. And as you stated from trees that have been used for other purposes that were yeah. various. Absolutely, because the, there, there's a really interesting kind of inherent contradiction with the way that the black body is tied to the landscape, right? I mean, it's tied to the landscape in one sense because we know that from the Baha'i context, the, the impact, of, the powerful impact of nature on the soul, right? How we can walk in natural spaces and feel lightened and kind of renewed and rejuvenated. But in the context of African-American history, uh, the tree is a site of lynching and also the brutalization of the black body. So those, th there's an intersection, uh, a tension that kind of exists with it, between that intersection, between on the one hand, the natural landscape bec becoming this place, this, this place of renewal and rejuvenation, but on the other hand, the site of brutality um, and uh, subjugation, so. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your art, thank you. Now, we are ready to hear more. Okay, uh, great. Well, <laughs> awesome, well, I will try not to, uh, to, uh, you know, to um, keep this interesting and keep it popping so nobody gets bored. So what, what we wanna do first is probably go to a slide presentation, uh, just kind of like a, a quick journey through some of the things that uh, has kind of wrapped my attention and uh, things that I've worked on in the past and I'm working on now. Uh, recently, I gave a lecture at Emory University called Excavation, Mining Memory for Restoration and Redemption, which was kind of like a broad overview of, of my visual work. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Back in 2016, I was part of a project with public broadcasting called uh, Sherman on the March, 37 Weeks, which uh, charted uh, General William Tecumseh Sherman's march through Georgia. 
um, and his subsequent um, you know, defeat of um, the rebel army, uh, the Confederacy, um, and uh, his march all the way to Savannah through Atlanta. And uh, while I was, I was the on-air talent for this production, and when I went to the premiere at the Atlanta History Center, um, they did something really interesting, which I didn't know what they were gonna do, which is they showed areas of Atlanta during a time of civil war, and then they gradually would fade up to show you the same location today. So I was stunned to find out that Five Points Martyr Station, which is the central um, train uh, station, commuter train uh, station here in the city of Atlanta, where all of the trains converge, right? actually during the time of the Civil War and before was the site of a thriving slave auction house called Crawford Frazier Negro Brokerage House. And I was stunned because as a student at Morehouse, I had traveled to this train station more times than I could count. 90% um, of the passengers who use public transportation in the city of Atlanta are black and brown. Um, but there was no marker, no indicator of the before life of this space. And I felt as though it was a kind of haunting of the space that the souls, the spirits of the people who passed from the auction block to the plantation uh, were haunting this space. Uh, there's a residue there. Um, so, and we know that from the Baha'i context, the, that the, the separation between the living and the dead is like the veil. It's, it's a thin veil of material. So there's a very close connection between those that have gone on and also those who are still living. So uh, I created this video with the only um, lone image that I could discover of the slave auction house that existed on this site. And it floats in and out of the space like the ghostly haunting uh, of the site that it is. So I'll play a few seconds of this. I don't wanna get too much into it because it's long, but I'll uh, give you an idea.
the whole the quotes in the beginning, uh, the one um, from um, uh, the one by Abdul Bahan the beginning, talking about the truthfulness is the foundation of all human virtues. Uh, the more we prop up lies in our society, the more that we reinforce a lie, uh, the more that we try to pave over um, a complicated history, the more that that uh, that we give life uh, to uh, whatever evil or whatever dispossession, degradation, dehumanization that took place, as opposed to doing the real hard work of healing by going through the crucible of truth to embrace our past so that we can have a clear understanding of how we got to where we are and we can chart a clear path forward. And then of course, the quote after that, which was from one of the most uh, uh, powerful books that I've read in a long time called The Repeating Body, uh, which talks about tying the black body. The black body is being a site, like a landscape, tying it to the landscape. It's a site of all of the history that has been exerted upon that body. So, um, you know, the landscape of Five Points Martyr Station being an example of that. Um, thinking a lot about uh, uh, black men, black women who had been killed, black and brown people who had been killed by police, um, this piece called Hive, which takes its uh, conceptual iteration from the uh, community surrounding the beehive. Uh, the beehive is sustained by thousands of bees that cluster together to support and maintain the structure of the hive. There's a cluster of black bees around this hive, um, which of course alludes to the black community. Um, and then on the ground, there are a cluster of leaves that have um, theoretically fallen from the tree limb. Silk screened on the front and the back of the leaf is the image of a black person who has been killed by police. So you look to the right, those are some of the names, Sean Bell, Fondo Castillo, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery. Um, interestingly enough, uh, recently with all of the killings that took place uh, the last couple of years and with the outbreak of COVID, I had a, it was the first time in my life that I had such a severe reaction to violence visited upon black people. Um, and with George Floyd uh, killing, I crawled into bed, could not um, eat or drink, didn't want to leave the house, uh, was gripped with a kind of hypervigilance, which is very common to black people. Um, that uh, felt overwhelming. And it took me a long time to kind of crawl out of that. Even prayer, which is such a central part of the Baha'i experience, couldn't give me any relief in that moment. I was just absolutely at my wits end. And I think that's experience that a lot of people, particularly in the black community have experienced. It's not just black folk. There have been some brothers and sisters from other communities who have felt the same way, but it is centralized. It is, it's ground zero is the African-American community. So uh, this piece was done um, thinking about those who were lost. Uh, this is the soundtrack that was created. Quote at the bottom from ta Coates, this is your country, you must find some way to live within it, uh, of course, is from between the world and me. Um, again, uh, images of young black men, uh, uh, black and brown men and women who have been killed by police. Sources of inspiration uh, for me, things that I reflect on and come back to again and again. This is all part of that narrative that uh, at least the slide on the right, uh, the image on the right, which of course is a lynching, a public lynching scene. Um, which is part of that narrative that this country tries to pave over and forget. Uh, it is the artist's job to live as a living witness to these histories, to uh, refuse to allow these truths to be buried, but to talk about them uh, with courage, with forthrightness, uh, with, um, with a certain amount of um, poetry and, um, and beauty in a way that it can bring them back to life for the viewer and we can begin to wrestle with them, the very difficult, these very difficult realities. Some of the photographs on the left, uh, protest march, things that inspire me, that compel me. And of course, Dr. Martin Luther King's quote, until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Um, Freedom's Price, 2016, um, 10 slingshots uh, pulled taut with stones facing individuals who 
protested um, uh, segregated busing in Jackson, Mississippi and were beaten as a result of it. Um, there's a drinking fountain um, at the heart of the uh, installation. On one side, there's a dividing wall that you can kind of see there. And then on the other side, there's a spigot and there's a segregation sign above that, um, above that uh, configuration. So on the left is whites only, on the right, on the other side of the wall is blacks only. Um, and I was talking about, for me, this was about the sacrifice that people are willing to make for justice. And we know um, in the Baha'i community, Baha'u'llah teaches us that the tent of civilization is held up um, by the pillar of justice. So justice actually is even more important than forgiveness according to the Baha'i teachings. It's a very profound um, um, concept uh, and, and reality to think about. It's another view of it. Um, again, these are all people who were beaten uh, jailed as a result of their um, protest, heroes of mine, heroes and heroes of mine, people that I look to again and again as touchstones of inspiration. Uh, the ballot and the bullet, the conflation of the philosophies of Dr. Martin Luther King and also Malcolm X, uh, the very real visceral threat of um, on black bodies um, when we would try to exercise the very fundamental right to vote. Um, being killed or being injured for voting was not a theoretical supposition. It is, was a living, breathing reality that we had to confront again and again. Inspiration, uh, Estate Mount Washington and St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands, where my family on my mother's side is from. Uh, this is one of the plantations where members of my family worked and cultivated sugarcane. Uh, the circle in the ground that you're seeing is where the apparatus for cultivating, for pressing cane juice out of the stalk of sugar was kept. And that's still, uh, the apparatus is still there. Uh, one of the more um, difficult uh, realizations as I was doing research was finding out that, that uh, it was not uncommon for children to lose their limbs because oftentimes it was children that was pressing the cane stalk through the machine. But if they were tired, they would get a little bit careless and their arm could get caught in the apparatus and their limbs would get torn off. Um, so the brutality of um, the slave system, which ironically, quite oftentimes these plantations are in beautiful locations. So you have all this beautiful vegetation. And again, this real contradiction between the brutality of the history and the beautiful natural surrounding. Um, so, and most of these estates in um, St. Croix, which at one point had 300 active plantations during the height of, um, of chattel slavery in the Virgin Islands, most of these plantations overlook the ocean. Um, and so you have this beautiful vista, but also this brutality. And, and you, for me, as I was standing there looking at these spaces, I was wrestling with the contradiction that was existing within me. The fact that I couldn't feel completely comfortable knowing the history of these spaces. And um, it was just a really profound kind of inner turmoil I was feeling as I was there. More inspiration from um, St. Croix. Uh, the pots you see on the left were for boiling the uh, cane juice. Um, this is uh, part of the sugarcane uh, production, which uh, was central to the slave system in, uh, in the Virgin Islands. Uh, harvest, this is a piece that is tied to that. Um, Stereoscope, one of the uh, original ways that people could make two-dimensional images three-dimensional. It's very old, it's from the 19th century, this technology. Um, the image on the right is the original image, which is of sharecroppers in 1903. The image on the, on the left is a engineered a reproduction of that. The only difference is, is that I am in that photograph. So I am the harvest of those who were laboring. Uh, who worked for free, who worked for pennies. I am their harvest. We are their harvest. Grounded uh, 2019, uh, the impulse of an airplane is to take off. Its very nature is to fly. That's what it is built to do. This airplane, which is hand carved, is covered in tar. It is draped with a cotton sack with raw, stuffed with raw cotton. Uh, silk screen on the back of the cotton sack is a quote from the great writer Isabella Wilkinson from The Warmth of Other Suns and also her powerful recent book called Cast. And she's talking about the economic um, disenfranchisement of the black community vis-a-vis -vis the apparatus of slavery, Jim Crow, um, segregated, uh, you know, restricted housing and hiring practices, which resulted in no generational wealth, essentially. Uh, in the black community for us to pass on uh, down to the generations to our children. So when people say things like the black community has pennies on the dollar uh, for the white community and they use that as a means to say, well, you guys don't work hard enough, you're not innovative enough. 
if we have the courage to look into the history and to be truthful, we see that this is a system that was set up systematically to disempower, to devastate the black community, which we still suffer from today. John Punch was one of the, uh, uh, is considered the first enslaved um, African in the Virginia colonies. This piece is called Punched. Uh, the writing that you see is from a court case uh, that took place uh, in the uh, 17th century. John Punch came over as an indentured servant. He was indentured to a very brutal landowner with uh, two European indentured servants as well. One was a Dutchman, one was from, was a Scotsman as well. And um, they, they were so afraid of the wrath of this landowner that they fled and they went to Maryland. They were captured in Maryland, brought back to Virginia for trial. The two Europeans were given an additional indentured service, servitude of two years while John Punch was sentenced to life as an enslaved person. He is considered the first enslaved African in the Virginia colonies. And so this piece, which combines a very literal interpretation of punch, you have a punching bag, and then it combines text from the court document and the name John Punch, you know, in, in terms of what I'm trying to get at here and trying to communicate is the idea that he was punched by the state, the apparatus of slavery. And of course that can, you can extrapolate that to include um, the entire African-American community, the African diaspora community, and indeed our Native American brothers and sisters and well through the dispossession of lands and so forth and so on. Uh, Hall and Ass, 2019. Uh, this is a play on words. One of the things that's really uh, compelling about um, the black culture is that this expressive use of the English language developed out of necessity. So terms and words were, became elastic. They became embedded with, do with double meanings. So I'm playing with that here uh, to talk about um, the impact of police brutality on the black body. I made this wagon from found wood. There is a figurine of a donkey resting on top of a book called Man Child in the Promised Land, which was an amazing book that I read as a kid, which is a coming of age story about a black youth in Harlem. And there's a powerful story within the context of the book where this young black youth is running from the police and then the brutality that's visited upon him um, as a result of his interaction with the police. Uh, the image, the silkscreen image, which is framed is of me running and there's a target around my body. Well, there's the figurine inside the wagon, which you can see, which is the ass and there's me uh, running and then the definition of haul and ass beneath. Uh, offering the definitions for these pieces is a way of opening the language up for people who may not be familiar with the, the way the Black folks use language. It's a key in a way to allow folks in who have been felt themselves locked out or just didn't have an understanding or awareness of what these terms mean. Again, a quote from Michelle Alexander from the New Jim Crow about the caste system. This is a, a powerful monologue that I wanted to play for everyone. It is from the uh, television show, American Gods. It is, uh, features the African god Anansi, who is the trickster god. Anansi is, uh, comes in the form of a spider. And he, has been, uh, he is also often associated um, with uh, those who are struggling with oppression. So in this scene, it takes place in the belly of a slave ship and Anansi comes to the enslaved Africans to show them a way forward. Just a warning for those of you who might be sensitive to language, there is some cursing in this video, but I think the truths that it speaks to are so powerful that um, we can endure uh, the language here. So if you have an extreme sensitivity to curse words, this might be a time for you to go and take a water break, go use the restroom. And for those of you that uh, want to see it, um, we're gonna play it now. So yeah, a really powerful, powerful monologue, which was written by that actor, uh, actually. Um, and embedded within that monologue as I listen to it again and again, and I'm stunned by his performance, but also the language, the versatility of the language and how it points to these profound truths is this concept of pupil of the eye, right? The origin story of pupil of the eye, which is the designation that Baha'u'llah gives people of African descent. And it's not because we have some particular profound DNA strand within us that just came with us at birth. It is because of the experience that we have walked through. That is why that spiritual distinction is there, to encourage, to identify the capacity um, as a result of existential threat, first experienced in the long march from the interior of Africa to the coast and in the belly of the slave ship, across the Middle Passage, then the cotton, the sugar, the tobacco, the indigo plantations in America, Jim Crow, 
the legacy of racism, bigotry, and injustice, and the that profound capacity to see both the physical and the spiritual reality, which was necessitated because of existential threat, right? We had to look deeply into reality in order to survive. Baha'u'llah saying to us, you are the pupil of the eye, the very wellspring of light. Yes, right? That's our spiritual distinction, our designation, our capacity as people of African descent. And that capacity is offered as a gift to the world, right? And our white brothers and sisters forming the sclera around the eye, which reinforces and protects the eye. Because we know if the eye, if that wellspring of light is not protected, we are blinded. We cannot know our way forward. So it is necessary to, to understand and to internalize that profound relationship between the white and the black, the spiritual distinction of the black, the white acting as that protectant, right? Encouraging, right? Reinforcing, because it knows that its destiny is bound to the destiny of the pupil. The destiny of the pupil is bound to the destiny of the sclera, this interrelationship, interdependency, not mutually exclusive, but interdependent. HNIC, which uh, many uh, people may or may not know, which is head nigga in charge. I was interested in exploring um, the uh, uh, profound ideas of surrounding power and the illusion of power. Uh, Baha'u'llah has this powerful quote about the world being a passing show, vain and empty, bearing the mere semblance of reality. Set not your affections upon it, break not the bond that united you with your creator. Verily, I say the world is like the vapor in the desert, which the thirsty striveth after it with all his might until he cometh unto it and findeth it to be mere illusion. How have we expressed, right, that profound spiritual teaching, that warning, actually, right, from Baha'u'llah in relationships? And one of the most profound ways that I can see within the context of the Black community is this illusion of power, of an overseer, a Black overseer, right, wielding a whip, ready to impose physical punishment upon his brothers and sisters from the continent of Africa, right? for his own survival, to have some illusion of power, but always the power in terms of that nominal dominion over his physical body is held by someone else. And then also a present day iteration, someone who has given their soul to corporate America, who believes that money, the acquisition of wealth, the acquisition of, of position and nominal power is the goal of life, right? The illusion of that, particularly when you don't really have any power. So the conflation of these two realities um, you know, the, the past and the present meeting in this space, HNIC, head nigga in charge. Twice as good, image of my little sister uh, when she was five years old, a uh, graduation photograph from, um, from kindergarten. And of course, a double negative uh, of her. And you have to be twice as good. This is language that uh, black children get all the time. So it's not enough just to be uh, as good. You have to be twice as good to get half as much. That is the tale that we're told on a continual basis growing up. Whip on the right, whip is a Southern term to refer to someone's car. I'm saying, I'm going to get my whip dog. Where you, where you whip at, man? Oh man, it's in the shop, man, I'm gonna pick it up next week. But of course, when we're talking about double meanings of language, the bull whip used to brutalize black bodies during chattel slavery. Soup coolers, I used to hear this all the time growing up uh, in the context of family gatherings. Boy, you got some lips on you. You could cool a whole pot of soup with them soup coolers. Soup coolers referring to the size of black lips, the voluptuousness, to the voluptuousness of black lips, right? Which was something that was castigated and derided historically. But now folks run to the doctor to get their lips filled with injections to, ha to have a more fuller mouth, right? So soup coolers was a way of using comedy in the black community, language uh, to inject something that was meant to be derisive. Um, but injected with a sense of humor so that it can become something, you can transform the language. Something that was historically used pejoratively can now become something that you can laugh at within the context of black community gatherings. Soup coolers, you can cool a whole pot of soup with one blow. Uh, in the center, you have the Campbell soup can. This is a, a kind of like a pointing towards Andy Warhol and the whole pop art movement and then the definition of soup coolers. So onion. Uh, this is about objectification and, mod and uh, commodification. Um, Black folks, uh, you know, in our community, we have things that we have to work on and overcome, just like every other community. And one of those is patriarchy, um, is the objectification of the female body. 
uh, in the black community, you'll hear somebody say, man, she got a nice looking onion on her sometimes. And that's looking at her backside. That's the objectification of the backside. So here conflated with an onion and they call it an onion. The folk tale is they call it an onion because every time you see it, it makes you want to cry because it looks that good. So this is the objectification, the dehumanization of women, which is part of patriarchy, right? Which is something that we have to confront, address, deal with, purge from our community. Uh, another example of that, bitch, bitch. Um, again, a female dog, image of a female dog, um, juxtaposed with the image of Harriet Tubman. Um, and of course, the one is a statement because that is a bitch. That's the official name for a female dog. And then the question is, would you call Harriet Tubman that name? This great Moses of, um, of the slavery era, you know, the liberation of black people from enslavement. This astonishing uh, human being who made so many remarkable contributions. So it's drawing, it attempts to draw into question how I view women. And um, will I, that term, which, you know, depending on who you are, you may have used flippantly, but should I be more thoughtful about how I use that term? Should I be more considered about how I use that term? This is an image of my mother, um, her high school graduation picture. It's been intentionally kind of faded out. Um, this piece is called Redbone. Uh, Redbone is a Southern black vernacular term, which refers to light skinned black people, usually of mixed race ancestry. My mother was very fair skinned. Um, I have taken the term and used it literally here and then also given you a definition. So you have a red femur bone that's it's been painted red. And then the definition of red bone in the image of my mother who was considered a red bone. Uh, pipeline, um, the school to prison pipeline, um, of course, playing with the literal interpretation of this, but also the metaphorical interpretation. A pipeline connected to a school desk, a pair of black hands resting on a dictionary in the seat and they are cuffed, they have handcuffs around them, and then a school clock and a school um, public service announcement speaker. And then uh, as the hands are resting on the dictionary, the word there on the page where pipeline is circled in red. Uh, tight packers, uh, 100 uh, sardine cans, which have been embedded with the drawings of black and brown men, talks about, uh, this is a conflation of the experience of the transatlantic slave trade with the incarceration of black and brown bodies in the criminal justice system. So you have these sardine cans. Uh, sardine cans are tight spaces where fish are packed very tightly. Um, black and brown men warehoused in the prison industrial complex, also alluding to the belly of the slave ship where people were basically packed like sardines. Um, and at the center of this piece is a class graduation photo. Um, these are some of the drawings. Uh, these are on, on the right, you see the incarceration rates among men, white men, ages 18, are older, one in 106. All men ages 18 or older, one in 54. Hispanic men, one in 36. Black men, one in 15. Black men ages 20 to 34, one in nine. I don't even know what to say about that. Uh, this is the graduation photograph here. Um, the black boxes indicate um, black, uh, black and brown men uh, and women who would have been missing ostensibly from this graduation and that loss of potential. Um, and of course, the poem from Langston Hughes, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it drive like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Beautiful poem, uh, kind of talking about this issue. Sankofa, uh, which is uh, part of the, um, uh, the grouping of symbols referred to as a dinkra, which come from West Africa. Sankofa, excavation as a, cons uh, a modality of constructive resilience. Sankofa is about reclaiming the past so we can know our way forward. Um, reclaiming the past so we can know ourselves, so we can chart a clear path forward. And so I draw on this Adinkra symbol as a source of inspiration in the work that I do. Uh, that's why a lot of my work is rooted in history uh, and uh, suppressed narratives. Uh, this is the Robert Turner Memorial, which we are presently in production on uh, at Cypress Lawn Cemetery near San Francisco. Robert Turner, of course, is the first African-American to embrace the teachings of Baha'u'llah. He was born into slavery in 1855-56 died in 1909, was a butler um, in the household of the Hearst family. The Hearst family, of course, is the inspiration for Orson Welles' uh, groundbreaking film, Citizen Kane. Um, Abdu'l-Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of Baha'i Faith, once said that uh, if Robert Turner would remain faithful to the cause of God, he would be the door through which a whole race of people would enter the kingdom of heaven. So here I've created a doorway through this block of stone, which stands about five feet tall. This block of stone weighs about 7,000 pounds. 
and this door in Corton steel, which is pulled a little bit to the right with this etched image of Robert Turner, the dates of his life, and then the quote about him being the door through which a race of people will enter the kingdom of heaven is inscribed on the stone block on the left-hand side to the bottom. Um, and then that's the that's the stone, that superstructure, the stone superstructure. And if you look to the right, that's the full installation as it will appear uh, when it is installed. Uh, the object in the foreground is the universal image, uh, the universal symbol for the soul, which will be cast in bronze and it'll look like a womb growing out of the earth. And there will be the symbol for Sankofa at one end of that piece in, uh, of the grave marker. And at the top end will be the nine pointed Baha'i star. And then a quote from Abdul Baha will run the entire length of the belly, which talks about Abdul Baha talking about the countenance of Robert Turner. Look at the flame in this man. Do you see the flame in him? And hopefully this will be a touchstone of inspiration for the Black Baha'i community specifically, for the um, Baha'i community at large, and indeed for the world to see that in this faith and this revelation, people of African descent have a particular distinction. And we are acknowledging, we are coalescing around that distinction. We are holding it up and um, we are uh, providing context through the powerful medium of art for the public. This is a proposed piece called Hush Harbor for John Lewis, which I just proposed. Uh, it is uh, to be built uh, just outside of Atlanta, south of the airport in a wooded space. Um, it's based on the design of a traditional shotgun house, which historically was uh, an indicator of poverty and dispossession. Uh, it was called a shotgun house because there's one way in, in the front door and one way out in the back door. You could fire a shotgun, the bullet could travel through the house unimpeded by uh, obstacles. What I've taken here is the, the, the frame structure of the shotgun house and transformed it into hopefully something that uh, has a spiritual kind of reverberation. There are stained colored glass panes with between the wood, um, the wood framing of the house and those are transparent. So when the light hits, in, hits those panes, they um, send a kaleidoscopic array of uh, colors to the base of the structure. The bottom of the structure is a stone kind of flooring. And at the center of the stone flooring, you can kind of see a circle there. There's a quote from John Lewis, which talks about the fact that we only have one house and we all have to work together to maintain our one house. In the foreground, there's a stone marker and that will have um, John Lewis's name and three phrases about his life, um, civil rights leader, uh, congressman, servant. And so that's Hush Harbor for John Lewis. This is the quote that it will appear on the uh, stone floor. Uh, the symbol at the top is the Adinkra symbol for community and unity in the, uh, amongst the Adinkra symbols. Elder, which was a piece that I did not too long ago, which was in honor of, um, which is honor of a school here in Atlanta, uh, which was on one of only two schools that was, that would admit black students, that would educate black students during the time of um, segregation. Uh, the gentleman who uh, actually built this school um, was a formerly enslaved uh, person who when slavery ended, uh, he started a business uh, as a mortuary, he started a mortuary business, which is one of the few areas that blacks could uh, find some kind of uh, nominal financial security. He became successful and he used uh, a lot of his money to purchase uh, 11 acres of land. And on that land, he built the first school, which is called the David T. Howard School, named after him, which educated uh, black students in Atlanta. Some of the notable graduates of the David T. Howard School, initially it was just a grade school, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, another uh, great uh, graduate with that, with, of that school would be Maynard Jackson, the first black mayor of Atlanta, Georgia and a number of other notable, extraordinary human beings who passed through that school. So we took one of the old growth elm trees that used to stand on the grounds of the David T. Howard School. This tree had been there for about a hundred years. Many people had probably had lunch under that tree, had probably courted their girlfriend or boyfriend under that tree. So the, uh, the, the students were tied to the history of that tree. And we used the, uh, the hands of the alumni, which we cast, we made mold, uh, moldings off of, and we cast the hands of alumni who went to the school and made branches growing off the trunk of the tree. So they are reaching out back towards the school, the newly renovated school, which is directly across the street 
um, towards their home uh, where uh, they were educated, where they were nurtured, where they were loved uh, into the fullness of their being uh, as they move forward in their life. And next we'll watch a quick video and I think that'll end the slide presentation. And here you see David T. Howard's school. The old red buildings are from the original school. And of course, the newer ones are from the newly renovated part of the school. And it just reopened. It was closed for a year because of COVID. OK, I think that ends the slide presentation. So. Um, why don't we engage in a little bit of conversation? Give me a little breather before I do a monologue. I'm glad that you offered us that because there's, there are, there, I have so many things that are running through my mind, but the one that kind of stands out, I think actually too, one has to do with the importance of truthfulness that you wove that through your whole presentation and yeah. the importance of it. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you wanna say a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, truth is, according to the Baha'i writings, the foundation of all human virtues. So That's there's actually, it is the, it is the rubric, right? It is the foundational stone to build our house of virtues upon. So I might pretend to be um, courageous, loving, kind, humble, honest, but if it's not predicated on the truth, it's all a lie. So um, it's one of the things to think about as we are wrestling with the history of this country is to have the courage to look at the truth, to look at reality and to say, this is, this is who we were at one point. And we're choosing by um, coalescing around the truth fearlessly, right? We are mustering the courage to look at the truth. We're choosing a different present and a different future for ourselves. Beautiful. And, Thank you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. If you had no, I was just going to say it, and we and we can see that there. That's that's in a large context, but we also see that in interpersonal relationships. If my relationship with you is not based on the truth, right? It's based on a lie, and because it's uncomfortable for me, I don't want to deal with a reality, right? That may have happened between us, maybe something I've done, so I choose not to talk about it, which is disrespectful. It's dehumanizing. It's dismissive of your reality as a human being. Um, and then we can't enter into a sincere, deepened relationship because of that. There's always that fissure there that gets in the way for us having that meaningful conversation, that heart to heart soul connection, because there's a dissonance that I refuse to address. And that's part of justice. Yes, and you did talk about that as well. There's one other thing that I'd like to, for you to say something about. We talk very often about the suffering, the trauma, the oppression of black people. But that one slide that you showed of the two black men hanging from the tree yeah. and all the white people standing around, yeah. um, it's, a, it's a day to come out and enjoy the good weather. Yeah there has to be something happening to the hearts of them as well. You want to say yeah. something about that? Yeah, I mean, this is something that we don't often talk about, right? It is. It's, it's because we're, 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 I mean, rightfully so, we're looking at it, we're paying attention to, the, to those who have been victimized. I mean, if a woman is violated, you want to focus your attention on the woman and not necessarily the one who's the victimizer. So you're interested in triaging her wound, which we should be. Um, but we really, the other side of that is what is lost yes. within the heart, the soul of the perpetuator of those things. And that was the Faustian bargain that was made when Europe decided to enter into a process of enslaving Africans. Yes. They were laying part of themselves on the block, right? Yeah. And they were losing part of their humanity by actively engaging in the dehumanization of their brothers and sisters. Yes. And there's deep sadness in regards to that, right? The fact that that, and that has to be reclaimed now. I was just gonna say, they have a sad culpa also. <laughs> yeah, and the only way you can reclaim that, yes, 
is by dealing with the truth, doing the hard work, the justice work, building conscious intentional relationships predicated on integrity, right? Right? Having the difficult internal conversations with self and also the difficult external conversations with my brothers and sisters who are different. That's exactly so right. Yeah. So well said, my sir. Um, I will save, because I know that a lot of people have questions that they want to ask. So I'll save my additionals. Those two really hung out for me yeah. because yeah. I feel so strongly about them. And yeah. I wanted yeah. you to say your heart from your heart about it. Yeah. So yeah. thank you so much. Well, this is an interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, so great to have a piece about John Lewis. Did my suit know the folks who did the John Lewis mural in Atlanta? Um, no, I don't. Um, it looks, I, I, I didn't, I don't know who that is. I love that mural though. I've been to that, when John Lewis passed, I actually went to the mural where everybody laid flowers there. So it's beautiful. I'm gonna read a couple of uh, praise. Okay. Just to sure. say. Who doesn't like that? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Just to say, insightful work, mm. such a sad subject. Mm. Well, going into such grief, help us heal from the pain. Mm. Hope so. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have to. We have to go there. We have to. You just said uh, that a little bit yeah. ago. We have to. I mean, that that's. Otherwise, what are you going to do? You're going to ignore it. You're going to pretend like it doesn't exist. I mean, and you don't even have to fully understand it. That's not. Bearing witness to something is not predicated on full understanding. Yes. You know, bearing witness, empathy, means that I am willing to sit with you. Yes. Even though I may not understand, you are important enough to me that I'm gonna be in this space with you. And I'm not gonna pretend to understand. I'm not gonna tell you what your reality is, yes. but I'm gonna be here with you yes. as we do this work together. You know, one of the things I think of listening to you is what, and what this person is um, alluding to as well, mm -hmm. is what Shogi Effendi said about it's a long and thorny road beset with pitfalls. Exactly. And so we can't expect if we're going to be truthful. Yeah. And if we're going to do this work the way it needs yeah. to be done. Yeah. It's going to be long and thorny and it's going Absolutely. to be pitfalls. Absolutely. Masood, you're a brilliant artist. I am overwhelmed. Mm. I am too, but that wasn't my words. That was someone else's. <laughs> Have you experienced resistance to the narrative you are telling in your work? Uh, sure. I've had people ask me if I was angry, which is the, I'm sorry. There aren't many dumb questions, but that to me is a dumb one. <laughs> um, of course I'm angry. Of course. Uh, I think anger is a given, um, given some of the experiences that I've had in my life, some of the experiences that I've seen my family members have. The question is not anger. God gave, gives us anger for a reason, right? Usually it's a response to an injustice, right? Or to a hurt, right? The question is, what do I do with the anger? Um, I'm not going, I'm not one of those people that believes in suppressing or pretending like um, a feeling that you're having is not there. I believe you need to embrace whatever that is and then make a choice about how you actualize that through action. What are you choosing to do? Anger, if used properly, can become a powerful motivating force for change, for positive change, um, for um, an exercise at correcting a wrong or an injustice. Uh, so if we use it, if we channel it properly, it can be a very powerful force. And Abdul Baha says there is one justifiable use for anger. And that is against the bloodthirsty tyrant. And I define mm. anybody, anybody to tell me that there is a more profound embodiment of a bloodthirsty tyrant than the system of racism that has plagued this country for some four centuries. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow. We're gonna if as as I'm able, I'm going to uh, share the question, alternate the questions with the praise. Sure. Wow, that performance was so very, very powerful. Thank you for showing it. Oh, okay. The world is a passing show. Um, I'll let you answer this. What is the source, the book this is written? I can't remember the book. It's from Bahola. Uh, and it actually, if, if, I'm, if I'm recalling it correctly, uh, it was composed, Bahola uh, penned that 
uh, he was inspired by a memory of when he was a child. He used to go to see puppet shows. His father used to take him to see puppet shows in Iran. And he noticed, even as a small child with his profound spiritual insight, he was drawing comparisons between the puppet show and the world. And he could see that the puppet show was a reflection in many ways of what was going on in the world. So um, that's the backstory, the, the, the source itself, I'm, I'm not sure other than I know Baola, that's from Baola. Okay. Yeah. Will you tell a couple stories of reactions to your artwork? Uh, you know, the piece with, with the sardine cans? Yeah. Uh, so when I had an exhibition of that work, there was a brother, um, this brilliant brother who had been wrongly incarcerated for 28 years. He went in as a minor league baseball player. Um, incidentally, what is really powerful about this story is that this same brother, this gifted, beautiful um, African-American man is married to uh, Stacey Abrams' sister, who is a judge. Uh, and they developed an association while he was incarcerated trying to get somebody to look into his case. So he spent 28 years in jail, wrongly convicted. He saw that piece and he said, man, he said, I, he said, I'm crying. He said, because so many of these faces remind me of people that I saw while I was inside. Um, and in that moment, it, it really, that was a really profound um, reaffirmation for me about the power of art um, that you can, you can put a word next to another word. You can put a note next to another note. You can perform a scene in such a way. You can put two colors side by side and they can move people in such a way, um, trigger something in their memory that they, for that moment, they are re-experiencing that reality. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's about joy. Sometimes it's about mm -hmm. sadness. Sometimes it's about consternation and fear. Sometimes it's about trepidation, but, that's the power of art to me is that it, it can actually, it's magic. It can transport us to another time and place. And I find that deeply gratifying um, and deeply um, just, a, just a profound gift to be able to, to, to work in that space. Thank you for your response. And so I'll finish with, uh, I'm gonna finish up with praises. Mm. Such a very, very powerful presentation and your sculptures are so engaging and so very truthful. Yes, you're doing the justice work. Mm. If the truth of the past is not told, how can we heal from the pain? I am rejoiced with my suit's work and weeping over the sufferings of our fellow man, which prompted his work. Thank mm. you, dear brother. That's from Tahari Ayat Adia. No, Tahari. <laughs> and we'll, we'll end it for now with that. Yeah. If we have time, everyone, we'll come back to the questions that you have. Well, I can share a little bit. Maybe it's a good time now for me to share a little bit of this monologue. Uh, this uh, is uh, a piece that was written by a brilliant playwright in Atlanta called Adai Moon, who um, is a brother of mine. Uh, it tells the story of Dave Drake. Dave Drake uh, is a, was a remarkable human being. He was an enslaved African um, who during the course of his enslavement learned how to make pots. And he was remarkably gifted as a potter. Uh, so gifted indeed that uh, there began to develop a demand for his pots as he would sell them at uh, fairs, and, uh, you know, different uh, exhibitions. During his time of enslavement, his master worked out a deal with him. And I say master with quotes, um, where he would allow him to bring his pots to market and he would split um, you know, the, uh, the money that he was able to earn through sale. Uh, Dave Drake's pots uh, were extraordinary for a number of reasons. They were, very, they were very large. They required an amazing amount of strength, dexterity, and skill. And he innovated glazing techniques to such an extent that people are still practicing the glazing techniques that he originated today. Um, his pots are some of the most valuable pots in the United States. Um, that you, that you can find. Oprah Winfrey, I believe, has a few of them, some other um, leading people. Um, the Atlanta History Center has a few in their collection as well. The other remarkable thing about Dave Drake is that he was literate, he could read and write at a time when it was against the law for an enslaved African to learn to read and write. And his way of rebelling against that was to sign his name on his pots. 
and also write his poetry. He was a he was a poet, and he would write his poems on his pots. So when you see a Dave Drake piece, um, most often than not, it will have his name and a a small poem that he has composed on the pot. So he's a remarkable human being. This is uh, this is not a pot by Dave Drake. I I can't afford a pot by Dave Drake. <laughs> Uh, this is from the Atlanta History Center, which was kind enough to allow me to uh, to borrow one. Clay Palm to Earth is the, is the name of this piece. <sighs> oh, man. This here pot was a bone in a muddy stream. <laughs> yeah, we stand in that stream with that water halfway up your leg. Fingers and hands digging in the side of the river, digging, grabbing, pulling out handfuls of thick red earth. You see, it all begins with the earth, children. Every great creation has one singular point of origin, and for this here pot, well, it's the red clay from the earth. Now, we would put that clay in the wagons to haul off to the shed in order to dry. Back when Master Drake and I practiced and learned how to make pots back there at Pottersville Stonewood Manufactory. That's what Master Drake's uncle, Dr. Abner Landrum, called his factory back there in Edgefield, South Carolina. <laughs> oh, we would separate the red clay from the white. Now that white was sturdier. And because of that, it was considered to be of more value. But uh, to my mind, well, <laughs> oh, that red was prettier. And it was easier to work with. So after a while, I started to mix the two. <laughs> Without anybody knowing, of course. You know, maybe that's why nobody ever tried to make the pots I make. Nobody was willing to experiment or to take a risk. But then again, back then, breathing was taking a risk. You see, I was what they call uh, country born. Well, that's what they called the blacks who were born in America back then. They called us country born. Now for those fresh off the boat Africans, they always made white folks nervous. They never knew whether or not they would starve themselves because of a depression or start a rebellion. But for us country born blacks, we were considered less of a risk to their minds easier to work with, almost invisible. <laughs> we was more valuable to the slave masters because of that. So I guess you could say for us country born blacks, there was a certain kind of magic in invisibility. <laughs> the thing was, they, uh, they never saw me. I mean, they saw their property or their chattel, but they never saw Dave. <laughs> I had um, five different masters that I can recall. Oh, shucks, maybe more. You know, it's been so long that I don't even recall. But what I do recall that is on one of my first pots, I wrote the words, Dave belongs to Master Miles where the oven bakes and the pot boils. They never saw me because the real day was hiding in the pots I made. Now that is the truest form of magic, children. Magic and resistance. 
Now you have to remember, it was illegal for slaves to learn how to read and write by 1834. But that didn't stop me none, at least not initially. Although there was a period of some 17 years when I didn't sign my name or write my poetry on any of the pots I made. You see, some folks forget. I know, no, that's wrong. Rather, they choose to forget what it was really like for the enslaved and the slave owners back then. You see, there were rebellions and rumors of rebellions all throughout the South. Some folks actually want you to believe that we slaves didn't realize that slavery was wrong. <laughs> that we was all sitting around singing and dancing and playing the banjo all day. <laughs> oh. But to tell you the truth, after working from sunrise to sunset for no pay, we was too tired to put on a show. Besides, <laughs> I can't play no banjo. <laughs> now all those rumors of rebellions made the slave masters nervous. And the more nervous they became, the more laws they would pass to try and keep us in our proper place. They called these laws the black codes. And don't you know that one of them even made it a crime for slaves to learn how to read and write? And after the big attempted slave uprising in Augusta, Georgia in 1819, I decided that the best thing for me to do would be to stop making my pots, signing my name or writing my poetry for 17 years. 17 long years. The thing was, was that this invisibility was different. I mean, 17 years and not been able to sign my name or write my poetry. After a while, sort of became invisible to myself. That was the uh, saddest time of my life. Anyway, I, I want y'all to do me a favor, close your eyes for just a moment. I want you to imagine yourself pulling handfuls of thick red earth from the riverbank throwing it at the wheel. You're sitting at that stool, kicking that wheel to make it spin. Your fingers pulling in deep. You're recreating yourself over and over again, pot after pot, but with no words to speak your name. No way of saying that I made this here pot with my own hand. Oh, children, <laughs> 17 years is a long time to be invisible to the world and to yourself. You know, some folks wonder why I stayed in South Carolina after emancipation. I mean, all of my former slave masters and their families have left and even my own flesh and blood kin had moved on too. Shucks, with my skills, <laughs> I could have earned a decent living everywhere. But to tell you the truth, that small town in Edgefield, South Carolina is where I was born. Standing in that muddy stream with that water flowing up halfway up my legs. No, no, it wasn't my actual birthplace, mind you. But that was the place where I was born. The place where I learned my value. Some folks talk about God as being the first potter. That he created everything in this wide green world from the 
soil right here beneath our feet. <laughs> well, I'm not blasphemous enough to liken myself unto God, but I do know what it is to create a man, to work magic with palm to earth, and to cast a spell with words. I know I've been changed. I know I've been changed. I know I've been changed. Angels in heaven gonna change my name. Clay palm to earth. No words, my son. I have no words. I've never heard of David Drake before. Thank you for introducing him to us. The whole idea of different ways in which you can be visible to yourself. That's a, one of the things you brought out. Yeah, yeah. Reminds me of Wilma Ellis's father. Yeah. He did that through his diary. Yeah. 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 We see it, you know, it's, that's such a powerful point because <clears throat> there's a deep love in the African American, I believe, the African diasporic Baha'i community for Abdul Baha. And for the Guardian, of course, Baha'u'llah is so majestic and so grand, right? He is the source of the revelation. The revelation comes through him. But in terms of a more personal relationship, there's this connection and closeness with Abdul Baha and the Guardian, Shoghi Effendi, Abdul Baha's grandson. And I think at the core of that relationship is this deep, feeling that we are being seen, that Abdu'l-Baha sees us, yes. that he loves us, yes. that he's willing to take a stand for us. And of course, we see this in a number of instances throughout his life where he was demonstrable, right, in standing up for racial justice. Perhaps, you know, the two most profound, of course, the one with Robert Turner, where Robert Turner said, after becoming a Baha'i and meeting Abdul Baha in the Holy Land, he says, never again will I allow the world to throw dust in my face. Mm -hmm. He was transformed in that relationship. Mm -hmm. Then of course, we see Abdul Baha coming to America in the early 1900s, coming to Washington DC in 1912, 1913, right? We meet a man named Louis Gregory, a member of the Talented Tenth, along with W.B. Du Bois and many others educated at Howard University Law School. Abdu'l-Baha speaks, of course, at Howard University Law School. And in the wake of that, what I'm sure was a remarkable presentation, he's invited to have dinner at a stately home in a very exclusive part of Washington, DC. Louis Gregory comes to the home, but he stays in one of the rooms outside of the dining room where all of the fine china had been laid out. Everything was polished set up for the arrival of the master to have this beautiful dinner. He was obeying the racial customs of that day, the caste system, right? Which wouldn't allow black people and white people to dine together. Some of those present, perhaps uncomfortable with that caste system, nevertheless acquiesced to that because they knew it was the law of the land. What does Abdul Baha do? What does he do? Where is Mr. Gregory? But he's in the other room, bring him in here. And he seats him in a place of honor. He sees us. He sees us. And we love him. Yes, sir. Because he sees us. 
Yes, sir. You know, this is, you have so much to share and it's so powerful and so meaningful. Um, it would be great if we had another hour, but we don't. Yeah. There are some questions. I'd like to take just a few of them. We love you, Masood. Riveting. Praise, praise. One says, praise, can't say enough. Phenomenal, stunning. This is truth. And pray it leads to justice. We are blown away. Just amazing and moved and humbled and inspired. Soul gratitude to you. My question is about the tree installation. Yeah. Had the tree already fallen? And yeah. what was the netting for? Uh, the, the tree had, it was actually on the border. It had, it had rotted, essentially. It was still living, but it was rotting. And it was part of the renovation plan. They had to remove the trees. They planted new trees uh, around the newly formed perimeter, but they had to remove that tree. So uh, the fencing and stuff was embedded. It's all the stuff that had grown into the tree, which felt very sacred to me. I would not touch that at all. There was something about the lived experience of that tree that uh, I wanted to maintain. So that's all of that fencing and stuff that you see embedded. I think there's a stop sign that's embedded in it. I had grown up and actually consumed part of the environment around it. So, okay. yeah, yeah. Can you speak more about how capitalism and racism interact and mm -hmm. reinforce each other? Yeah. yeah. Specifically well, a, in America. An easy question, right? <laughs> very complex. I mean, the one. entire, I mean, they, 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 let's go back to the root. The two are intertwined in the very yeah. beginning. Um, the reason that people enslaved other people was for capital gain. And of course, when you start your financial system, your banking system, your um, system for goods and services predicated on the enslavement, the degradation of a group of people, be they enslaved Africans or the dispossessed lands of dispossessed uh, native and indigenous people, um, everything that comes out of that, if that taint, that pollution, that sinfulness is not cleansed, is touched and polluted by that, yes. by that seed. That was a seed that was planted. So um, the intertwining of racism and capitalism goes back to the very root, the very founding of this country. Um, so that's, that's a quick answer, of course, I'm sure it doesn't go in to as much detail as this person might like, but that's, that's the beginning of it. Yeah, I think you took, I took all of the complexity and, and, and uh, uh, distilled it down to its very source in the beginning. Thank you so much. I would like for you to say any last words in the next couple of minutes, mm -hmm. and then we will uh, start winding down. This is wonderful to uh, be able to be in this space with you, Sue, and uh, to talk about it's an, Oh my God, it's been an amazing honor. Mm. It's it well, made my week. Mm -hmm. I will be reflecting on this. Seriously, I'll be reflecting on the things that you have shared all week? Well, I, the, the one thing I would say, and I think this is very important, um, I am not an anomaly. There, is, there are examples of brilliance in every segment of the African-American community, in every segment of marginalized populations. We have historically overlooked, diminished, dismissed the contributions of these groups. Thankful to God that we have the spiritual distinction that Baha'u'llah gives people of African descent, because what you have embedded with an individual is a universe of possibility. And we have to be mindful that the person we might dismiss, overlook, marginalize, might be the one who might discover something that might save our lives or someone that we love. Precious opportunity every time we come in contact with, with uh, individuals who come from these populations. They are untapped gems. Wow. <laughs> I, can't, I, cannot, I, I, I cannot agree more. Thank you so much. So for everyone, I just would like to close by hoping that first of all, that you 
took from this as much as I have and that you will have opportunities to reflect on some of the information that has been shared with us. Masu, brother, thank you so much. Thank you. I thank should you. say son, because you're, you're <laughs> my son's age. <laughs>